Damn, moving quickly. That's right. It's like we're getting better at this. We're not though, but it's say. like that. But we can like pretend. That. We can I mean, pretend. You know, I think we've we reached a certain level of competency and stayed there. Yeah, we plateaued <laughs> really <laughs> hard. I don't want to. I, I don't want to get too much competency. I, this is the uh, union I'm, way, and that's why yeah. we're a union podcast. Yeah, I think we just need a solid C average podcast. I don't. Mm. Think you know what they call doctors who had a C average in medical school? Doctor. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Uh. Well. W- welcome to. Well, there's your problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters with slides. Um. I'm Justin Rosniak. Who is the person who is talking? at this moment uh my pronouns are he and him all right um alice goldwell kelly the person who is presently talking at this current moment my pronouns are she and her and that guy on the screen looks like luigi oh yeah, he does yeah he's he's having a, a tough time uh hello he's got, i'm got liam An- i'm liam anderson <laughs> my pronouns are he and him <laughs> you dick <laughs> I was I was just commenting on I was responding to Alice there who made a comment and I was adding he's having a bad time because he's got the green helmet which means he's 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 new on job sites such as this. Imagine that being your first fucking day, huh? Ooh. Oh my god! Yeah, like good. coming home to your wife, like I don't think I want to go back tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Guess how many corpses I dug out, honey? Well, oh boy. the good news is that they're mostly reduced to sort of like. Ashes there, so yes. mm. they're portable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here, here, With this here, one here. weird trick, funeral directors hate him. <laughs> My dad uh, said that he wanted to be cremated, and then uh, me put his the urn in my car. And when my children misbehave, they have to hold grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, what you see on the screen. Um, it's very difficult to make out what it is because it was on fire a lot. Mm. Um, mm. But at one point, it was a funicular, right? A little mountain railways. Oh, yeah. Today we're going to talk about the Caprun disaster. Caprun? Caprun? Mm. I don't know how to... Oh, well, it's Austrian. It's Austrian. It's Austrian. Oberammer, Austrian. Uber, Gertz, Wugli. Yes. Hold on, I'm going to turn the gain up on my mic here. Yeah, how am I? I guess more Justin in the headphones. Some more Roz in my <laughs> monitors, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, that looks a little bit better from my Ooh, perspective. crisp. A crisp yes. Justin. Oh, yes. yes. Well, I'm hard as hell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's how we want um, to record this podcast. Fully erect. Yeah, yes. I am pointy. <laughs> Helps you be more alert. Um, then you get that, Make you it get, more rigid. Yeah, yeah that's the, what I'm doing, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> get that, uh, get that post podcast clarity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, so yeah, uh, this was uh, uh, a fire on a funicular in a tunnel. Bad combination. But uh, first, we have to do the goddamn news. <laughs> Oh man, does it ever fall down? I was about to say, this is, uh, well, we had to do the obvious one. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's going to be a may, long news segment. Yeah, we may, uh, we may talk about this more extensively in the future once some more information comes out. Um, but yeah, I, building, I made the joke that like yeah. um, we are the timeliest engineering podcast. We will report the facts a mere five years after they emerge. Yes. Yes. Um, a building in Surfside, Florida, just north of Miami uh, Beach, uh, fell down, big condominium, uh, partially collapsed. Um, And it's weird because, you know, big tall buildings don't usually just fall down, certainly Mm. not without any warning. Yeah, normally Uh, you have to like fly two planes into them. Yeah, I mean, that's one way. Usually there's like really obvious structural damage. this one, I you know, the more I look at it, the less sense it makes to me. Um, you know, it's it's very um, it, it's very odd because it, you know, so far I think what's come out 
is, you know, the uh, there's that engineering report that came out, right? And everyone's pointing to, okay, so there's damage under the pool deck, which is like over here, right? Mm. Which is not especially close to the part that fell down. Um, and then yeah, all the images are of concrete spalling under the balconies, which is, you know, just something that balconies do. Like, like all balconies do that because, you know, they're so exposed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, it, it's very weird. I mean, this is, this is sort of one of those things, um, you know, if you, uh, obviously it's, uh, you know, killed a whole shitload of people, right? Oh, yeah. A ton of people uh, missing still. Oh, yeah. All those like, people uh, are probably dead. Yeah, yeah I, know. One of those, I, like, I fucking know. One yeah. of those urban search and rescue nightmares in, like, an mm. already not fun job. Right. But it's just, so, it's very, it's weird. It, it's, it's a mm. weird collapse uh, so far. Can we um, pin this on climate change? Because as, to get our Soros money, that's what we have to do, right? Is to, to tie everything back to climate. Is this climate change's fault? I sort of had a theory that might, that might explain it that way. Um, mm. Please note, this is not an official engineering opinion. This is um, not engineering advice. This is not engineering advice. Um, it is investment building, advice, though, weirdly. This no, that's building my job, is, um, motherfucker. Yeah, and legal this, advice. Yeah. You should give us power is, of attorney. We are actually... Do it. Sign yeah. it over to us. <laughs> Send us power of attorney papers to the P.O. box. This building was built, if I may go on, no. um, <laughs> on, on top of an underground parking garage um, adjacent to the seafront, right? Hmm. So, as a result, the whole building was essentially sort of a, a, a boat. <laughs> Resting on the groundwater. <laughs> okay. Oh, terrific. Okay, um, that sounds good. You know, it has some buoyancy, right? I looked through the plans that were on um, the Surfside website, which, by the way, if you look at them, uh, good luck, because there's some... Um, yeah, you were very mad there, about that yesterday. There's at least four separate copies of the same set of plans in there. Some of the sheets are missing. One of the things I thought was conspicuously absent was the foundation plan or the most up-to-date one that corresponded with the, the, um, the, the foundation details. Um, kind of the thing that would be helpful if you were looking for a bunch of people or corpses trapped in like, the collapsed ruins mm -hmm, of this building, mm -hmm, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the column plan for the parking garage was there, but the foundation plan was not. Mm. Um, this building has deep foundations of some kind. I can't tell if it's piles or if it's... Um, I forget what the, the term is. I, uh, I forget what the technical term is. Something called Frankie piles, which um, have uh, uh, they're a weird great. sort of. Yes. Um, very, very popular in Hollywood, of course. Um, but they, uh, they um, are. Uh, Frankie goes to Hollywood. Is that anything? Thank you. Yes, yeah, that was that was that was that was the joke was I was dope. making. Oh, uh, it was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I should probably like have detected that. <laughs> so. You know, these are, but these piles were driven down until a certain specification. Some of them were, you know, bearing the weight of the building, but some of them were tension piles, which actually hold the building down rather than support it because the groundwater is changing with the tides. Um, mm. It's a pain in the ass to like build a city on like porous limestone by the sea, right? Yeah, it is. It um, turns you know, out. there's all kinds of weird forces acting on this. I thought maybe if this were linked to climate change, you know, since the sea level is going up, the 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 forces, especially on you know the midsection of the building, adjacent to the core of the building, which is the most rigid, would sort of cause it to uh, uh, bend in that section, mm. you know, and that would eventually, over the course of 50, 40 or 50 years of cyclical loading uh, caused the failure of structural members in that area. Um, it's a 40 year old building, right? Yeah. And the reason I remember that is because uh, Surfside, Florida requires buildings to be inspected every 40 years, and it's 40 years old. Yes. Oh, they almost made it. Almost made it, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's a shame. That's sort of my theory if it is something to do with climate change. It's that. Because I used to think, you know, climate change, okay, it's going to look like, you know, that Onion article about 
uh, New York City being inundated and everyone riding an MTA whale to work. Um, <laughs> but it may actually be something like, well, you have a moderate amount of sea level rise and all of a sudden buildings start randomly falling down because mm. of the hydrostatic pressure. Um, we could, we could, we'll probably go into this in more detail later. It's sort of just a theory I have. Um, need, to, need to really do a climate episode, I think, when we can get oh, fully yeah. doom-pilled on that. Yeah. We'll talk about uh, the, the, the solution to climate change I came up with. Okay. Is this going to be your big hole? Yeah, it's the big hole. God damn, I hate the big hole. <laughs> the yeah. big hole project. Peaceful yeah. uses for the atom. Oh, yeah. I don't know if we could use an atom bomb to do that. I think you would have to get some really big excavators. We'll talk about the big hole later. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is a weird, weird collapse to me. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me that, you know, damage, which is again, over here is going to cause stuff over here to collapse. Um, controlled but, demolition. Biden went in there with no. a pickaxe. Oh, <laughs> Just he's wearing his aviators, he's like hammering away at some support columns. I'll tell oh, you, yeah. Jack is listen, listen, listen Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is a hey, it's weird. It's just weird as all hell, is all I can say. That's well, because it was a controlled demolition, Roz. I no, because a controlled demolition no, it was would controlled have, Roz. probably they'd probably take down the whole building. Yeah, I can't wait for the truthers to be in the comments. And then uh before anyone comments that we're being insensitive, yes, that's kind of the whole bit. We know. It's a vibe. Yeah. It, it's we we know. Uh, get mad someone got mad at us on Texas City and I just What was well, the episode I was expecting too, to get mad too at? Too soon. On? Too soon. Yeah. You know how well, like like trauma surgeons like, you know, they, they always get fascinated to go see like, you know, some creatively mangled human bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Engineers are the same way about collapses like this. Mm. It's a you little know, bit I, of like gallows <laughs> humor, it's a little bit of professional curiosity. Yeah. You know, you go over there and you're like, oh my God, I can't look. And you put like your hand over your face, but you know, you got your fingers spread so you <laughs> actually can look, you know. <laughs> well, NIST sent a team of engineers to go and like um, investigate why this is happening. So we'll wait to hear back from them, I guess. Mm. Ah, the consistency of the uh, concrete was actually similar to the uh, NIST standard peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, only, only, only real fans, uh, will get that joke. Um, anyway, that's right. Um, so yeah, please send um, us the, NS the NIST cigarettes. We, we don't know what happened. Um, no, clear. No yeah, don't know. B build building full down. Building Mr. fall Bond. down. Make it rigid enough, Mister Bond. Yes. Nope. <sighs> well, I mean, it's reinforced concrete. You can't get more rigid than that. No, that attitude. <laughs> I'm All still right. sore about the Frankie goes to Hollywood thing. Can you edit that out so I sound smart? No. No. Damn. I have to sound like an idiot all the time. Yes. Okay. I thought we'd start by asking, what is funicular? Uh, it's a thing to, to go angle, train go angle. Yes. Inclined plane train. Mm-hmm. Because back in the day, when they decided to do locomotive power, they weren't sure whether you could make a locomotive go up a hill or not. Yes, exactly. There was um, so uh, early early railroads were built with inclined planes rather than like consistent grades. They were built sort of like canals. You have long flat stretches, um, and then you'd get to a point where you wanted to change elevation. You'd have something called an inclined plane, where you'd unhook the cars from the train, um, and you would haul them by rope up to the top of the hill, and then attach them to a new locomotive, which would take them to the next inclined plane, and that's how you got over a mountain. That was like, nice. that's real early mm. railroading, like yeah. 1830s, mm. 40s. You can mechanize um, this too, you can have like a lift for uh, like a train that like just lifts it vertically. Or an engine of some kind. Yeah. 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 Or you could have, um, you could have the descending train pull the ascending train up, thereby, um, Right. Uh, There's cableways of. like that that are still operating. Those are terrifying. You'll just be oh, able yeah. like a fucking like fifty degree hill. Oh, don't like that. And, <laughs> yeah, we'll just we'll just shoot this one car down and it's gonna pull the other one up. 
It's one of those in um, Cornwall, I think, yeah. which is like the, the, going down it. The view out is like uh, if the brakes fail, you're just going straight in the harbor, which is which very is funny. Fine. Yeah, we... a little ramp at the end. Yeah, <laughs> it's like like fucking burnout with the crash mode. You know, you're trying to aim where you're gonna throw this cable car. But there's um, there were you know, eventually uh, they realized okay, you can actually build a train that's power enough to pull a train uphill. So inclined planes for railroads were obsolete fairly early on, but there were still specialized applications in the form of funiculars. Right um, now. A funicular usually, but not always, only moves passengers, right? You have uh, two cars that ascend and descend an inclined plane, uh, and they're permanently attached to each other by a haul rope that goes up the plane, around a pulley, and then back down. So the descending car pulls the ascending car up. Mm. Um, so that they, they counterbalance each other so there's less uh, power needed in order to move the cars, right? Um, here, here's, here's an example from Cincinnati. Um, we got the store that saves you M. Oh yeah. The store that saves you M. Uh, and this is, this is, these, these, these particular funiculars are for, they carry streetcars as well as road traffic. Um, what? Imagine, imagine oh, okay. being the horse, oh, okay. uh, like hitched to that cart on the right there, just being like, what, what the, the fuck? fuck? <laughs> He's probably done that like 20 times before. Yeah, and he's probably still scared shitless every time he yeah, tries it. Horses. Because it's all, like it's this okay. sort of he's... staircase to nowhere in the middle here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, the horse is probably only going to do it 20 more times before he dies on account of being a horse <laughs> in, um, in, in fucking uh, uh, 1890s Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> That's a but beautiful like, building mo- mostly, in the back, though. Oh, it is. But yeah. like, most, mostly what you want to use a funicular for is like, it's a single like point-to-point thing. Like, you go up a mountain, and it doesn't yes. like, connect to anything else, right? Right. And it used to be very, very common in cities with, um, you know, escarpments uh, in America. Not so much today. There's only a couple left. Like, there's two in Pittsburgh. There's one in Johnstown. Um, there's, uh, that, those are the only ones I know offhand. There's one in Los Angeles. Um, that's a really short one. Um, oh, uh, Angel's Flight. Angel's Flight, yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, they're much more common in Europe where they're used, you know, everywhere, constantly. Yeah, because we've got a shitload of mountains that we just built cities on top of. Oh, yeah. So that's that's your, your basic funicular concept there, right? So here's... Why is it called a funicular? What's I have a funicular? no idea. I'm going to find out what a funicular is, something that I probably should have done before... We did the episode about a funicular. Someone, someone sent a tweet to the funicular magazine people. Uh, it derives from the word funi- Latin word funiculus, the diminutive of funus, meaning rope. Ah, huh, it's a little rope. Well, okay, that'll do it. Um, so we'll talk about a, a specific funicular, uh, the Capron funicular, which brings people to the top. Of the Kitsteinhorn, right? Uh, which is, oh God, people are doing a thing. Uh, okay, uh, what? It, it's what, a mountain. What, what thing are people doing? Oh, th- the Steam notification came up in the corner. Ah, uh, yeah. D- just, just like delete everybody off of your Steam friends list. Good idea. I don't talk to any of them. Nobody Steam, does. At least. No, you talk yeah. to me. Imagine somebody messaging you on Steam, the kind of like deranged energy that that would require. Oh, people used to do that. Ugh. Ba- back when I was accepting commissions for transport fee for mods. I don't do that anymore because it oh. doesn't pay well enough. Fucking no. weep. <laughs> you should do cities, uh, you should do um, uh, workers and resources mods. Oh god, that would be complex. <laughs> so, you know, this, this funicular is relatively uh, modern. It's in Austria. Um, it brings skiers up to the top of the mountain, right? This is uh, a single track funicular. I was going to ask loop about that in a tunnel. I was going to ask about that because definitionally, it's got to have two cars, right? Yes, but like one track. Yeah, so y- there's a few kinds you can have. There's you know your two rail single track funicular with a passing loop in the middle. You can have a really short passing loop because the cars always pass each other in the same spot. Mm. You can have 
a three rail funicular where, you know, you sort of, because you don't want to have the switching equipment, you just have the middle rail divide into two. Uh, so it goes into two tracks for a passing area and then merges back together. Or you can have a full two track the whole way funicular. Those are, those are the three ways you can do it. Hmm. But so this one, the lower station is like in the open air. The upper station was in the tunnel, right? Um, and it's sort of a, a single, single t- track tunnel. There's no, um, not really a way to evacuate easy. There's not really Feeling a real claustrophobic looking at this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, these, these cars are, were basically, you know, the idea was it'd be really, really difficult to get one of these to catch fire, right? Um, because mm, a funicular mm. is a very, very simple machine. Um, all, almost all the moving parts are up at the top and they're stationed and they're like, you know, fixed, they're stationary, right? Um, you just have an electric motor at the top pull, pulling the rope, you know, not much more complex than an elevator. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a bucket with brakes on it, right? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. Uh, this was uh, 12,800 feet long, 10,800 feet of which were in the tunnel, right? Mm, don't like that. Yeah. Mm-mm. So you're in there for a good few minutes, I assume. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, in this tunnel where you can't fucking put your elbows out. Yeah, I don't love yeah. this. <laughs> so now these, these cars, um, the cars on the funicular, they were replaced... In 1993, this is the replacement car. You see, it's very, very sleek and futuristic. Yeah, I like it. It's the way of the future. It looks like a cool that. bug. Yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of pixels in 1993. So, um, <laughs> no, they all burnt up. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the one advantage of funicular cars is they're very simple to make because there's not much motorized equipment or moving parts on the cars, right? Yeah, it's a so, bucket with brakes on it. Yeah, but you still need like stuff for passenger comfort. And means of yeah, maybe you right? do. Yeah, yeah. that just like climb, climb out of the bucket. <laughs> adds weight. <laughs> use <laughs> you, racing use, vernacular. Yeah, use mine carts, You know, I think uh, Liam and I took the uh, the Duquesne uh, inclined plane in mm-hmm. Pittsburgh. We sure did. And if I recall correctly, it was unheated. It was. It was <laughs> fucking miserable, and it was yeah. pouring rain. <laughs> Also, we didn't realize it was cash only. Um, oh yeah, we look like the, real assholes. The only assholes. ATM was at the top, so Love the lady Pittsburgh. just issued us a half a ticket and said, "Okay, pay twice when you come down." And then we didn't wind up taking it down. No, then we walked to the. We ended up at the at a bar on the south side, and I don't really remember what happened after that. Oh, oh that was <laughs> uh, we got no, we got very drunk at the tiki bar. Yeah, two dollar yeah. mixed drinks, man. Y- yeah. And you threw up off a bridge. And then no, I, I didn't threw, throw up. up. No, you didn't throw up. Oh, I right. almost threw up off the hot metal bridge. There we go. And I threw up the next morning on 376. Yes. <laughs> All right. Pittsburgh's <laughs> really good. Now I you enjoy Pittsburgh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we, we came back by way of Altoona to see Horseshoe Curve, which was closed. Um, which is just what the Nazis wanted. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> they tried to close it too. <laughs> <laughs> the handshake meme uh, between the Nazis, Pennsylvania Railroad, closing the Horseshoe Curve. Yes. And, Thanks for um, nothing, Norfolk Southern. <laughs> oh yeah, you could go there, you could go to the, the observation spot now, and you could watch, watch uh, put Norfolk, a train on the ground Yeah, twice watch them somehow. streamline a train on Horseshoe Curve. <laughs> <laughs> so, federalize the railroads. It's, yeah. it's, it's time. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you still need stuff for passenger comfort on a funicular, and you need means of egress. You know, you have automatic doors on here. So, and you need an emergency braking system, right? So the cars were equipped with both a hydraulic six a hydraulic system for actuating the doors, right? They have a larger hydraulic system for actuating the emergency brakes, and you know, a low voltage electrical system that operated the lights and the space heater. I think that was supplied from a cable attached to the car, right? Mm. So already we've got something that looks like the space shuttle if it was designed by a race of caterpillars, but it's way more complicated now. Uh, I don't think this is more complicated than the space shuttle. 
No, not in the space shuttles, in the previous <laughs> minecart, the fucking asshole. Oh, I see, I see, I, I misunderstood, I'm no, this sorry. No, is, this is way more complicated than the space shuttle. Yeah. That's, that's a got shit on this, <laughs> really. So, we should talk about the space heater they installed, right? In the space oh, shuttle? No, in, in the- The um, whole thing is space, Roz. That's a good point, yeah. They have a, they have a, it's, they have a sp- it's cold down there. It's a vacuum. What you paying so attention? Like, what do you, what, what use, do you need to? What do you need to heat? Use an, a space heater on us. Yeah, <laughs> you can't use a, a, a regular heater on the space shuttle. You need a space heater. <laughs> oh, it's from underground. Why not just read the whole book? <laughs> and why do we drive on the parkway but park on the driveway? <laughs> America's most inqu- America and Scotland's most inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So before we talk about this space heater, we need to talk about the difference between consumer and sort of industrial goods, right? Hmm. Oh, is this going to be another one of those things where you don't buy the uh, noise dampening foam at Home Depot, as it turns out? That's the worst KitchenAid I've ever seen. Was this made for Guy Fieri? What, you, you, you don't like a KitchenAid with flames on it? I love, I love a KitchenAid, but I've got like a white one. Hell, I've got Alice. a white KitchenAid. Yeah, and that yeah, shows uh, stains, uh, dumbass. I gotta, I gotta, I, I, I gotta clean s- it. Oh, 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 Alice, cleaning stuff. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I have a, I have a, I have a stainless steel one. No, um, that's nice. Yeah, but I wanted to get flame decals for it because I think it's oh, cool. Yes. I mean, by this point, just fuck around with like materials. Just get, give, give me your a inner shit bag, Ross. G- give me a bronze KitchenAid so I can see that patina. You know, uh, you, yeah. you can also get you can get like World War II bomber decals for them. That's okay, awesome. that's cool. I like the sound of that. <laughs> and Especially on the stainless, stainless, steel. stainless steel. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. 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 What you, you want to like some like decorative rivets on yours? I think. Oh, that'd be oh, tight. Yeah, that, that'd be pretty good. Yeah. This has been the KitchenAid corner. This is the KitchenAid corner, yeah. <laughs> so there's there's a big difference between you know consumer goods versus like durable industrial goods, right? Um, you know, if you buy industrial goods or products, uh, they usually run on you know a, a longer, uh, heavier duty cycle than consumer goods, right? So, for example, if you buy a car, right, and it's marketed to consumers. You know, it's sort of based around a concept that it, you know, spends 99% of its life parked in the garage mm. versus you buy a fleet vehicle like a Ford Crown Victoria for a taxi <laughs> or a police car or an F-150 work truck, right? Which, you know, is sort of built around the assumption that it's going to be on the road basically constantly for a long period of time. So everything's built more ruggedly. You know, and it's um, you know, there's cop a lot motor, of common and brakes, easily cop replaceable shots, yeah. parts. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, the cops absolutely destroy cars, not just yes. because they're driving them all the time, but also because they're bad drivers. Yeah. Oh God, mm-hmm. yes. This is true. That's why we have to yeah. raise the oil pan so when they drive over the curb, <laughs> <laughs> every fucking time. Yeah. Well, how else are you gonna park on the sidewalk? <laughs> you know. So. This is this is one of the one of the reasons Uber is so successful, right? Mm. Is um, you know, they you, just uh, you offload that repair cost and fleet vehicle cost to like right, a guy to, to a to, guy, yeah, who's not buying this, a fleet vehicle. They're buying just right, a car, he's buying thinking, a Honda CRV, yeah. Th- th- yeah. Thinking of a guy who thinks police reform is like training the cops to change gears properly. But grind it till you find it, Alice. <laughs> well, you, you could you could go into uh, you could go follow the uh, placard abuse. Uh, New York City Twitter account and see that yeah maybe we do need to get the cops to uh, stop just parking anywhere they want. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the the well there's your problem placard someone made for us. Oh yeah, oh, I missed that one. How did no, you miss somebody that? made it. Somebody made us a parking placard. It was oh. like on on yeah. a, a official like uh, official juicy like podcast vehicle. Oh, I like it. I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna print that out for the GTI. Yes, take <laughs> pictures. Yeah. Take pictures while you're illegally parked. I'm not illegally parked. Can't you see the placard? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is sort of um, uh, applies to, uh, you know, most consumer goods, like a consumer appliance, right? Not built to run constantly. If you have a stand mixer, which may have flame decals, you <laughs> might, you know, use it once or twice a month. Mm. But if you're a bakery, you need a stand mixer that can run for hours every day. 
right? That's what the flame decals more, are for. Yeah. <laughs> Durability. No, the flame decals add extra horsepower. Oh, by mistake. Yeah, the durability is um, harder function, to achieve. A function with of bigness. Yes. It's like a function of like simplifying and adding weight. This is my seven point four liter stand mixer. <laughs> yeah, same <laughs> engine they use the Viper. Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a stand mixer SRT. Yes. Um. Another another result of this is that consumer goods are often more failure prone than industrial goods, right? Because they're used in environments where certain kinds of failure can be tolerated better, right? Not, not to mention our great friend, planned obsolescence. This is also true. <laughs> you, so, you, your stand mixer doesn't work, you gotta go out and buy a new stand mixer. Yes, but it doesn't like ruin your business. <laughs> no. You're gonna be annoyed, but like, if you can afford the one stand mixer, it's gonna fail at about the rate that you can afford to replace it, more or less. Yes. And you could check this if you ever need to in computer parts with something called uh, MTBF, which stands for Mean Time Between Failures. Mm -hmm. uh, they use it in rating hard drives. So if you're ever in the market for hard drives or SSDs, be sure to look at that number and don't be a Liam. <laughs> Do not advise playing smart roulette. <laughs> <laughs> so an example of this is like, okay, like housing, right? A single family house is not built to withstand fire in the same way an apartment building is. Because, you know, it's smaller and theoretically there's more means of egress which the residents can get to more quickly, right? Mm. Um, or you may buy a toaster, right? And the toaster may be easier to set fire to than an industrial toaster because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's being monitored while it's in use and, you know, it, it needs to be cheap, right? which, you know, the industrial grade stuff doesn't need to be cheap as much, right? Mm -hmm. um, safety is always a trade-off between other concerns. Uh, this, this is, you know, everywhere and always, if you wanted perfect safety, we all live in, you know, soft bubbles all the time, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just going to keep adding electrical tape around the increasingly fraying phone charger I have and just hope for the best. Oh, a girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had, a, we had a good example from a previous episode, which is the station nightclub fire, where someone bought, you know, inappropriate uh, consumer material to deaden sound, which turned out to be extremely flammable and uh, murdered a whole lot of people when they subjected it to a use case it was not designed for, which was shooting fireworks at it. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is, you know, commercial and industrial goods and materials are designed to withstand a good amount of mistreatment, usually, which happens in commercial and industrial environments, right? Yeah, you're um, using it harder and also you're at work, so you don't care. Yes, right. and also if, if something goes wrong, you know, it, it, it's, it, you don't want it to fail in a way that's catastrophic. You maybe want it to fail in a way that, well, we can fix this at the end of the shift rather than shutting down a whole production line or a transportation system or whatever, right? Yeah, you have, you have defects that are more repairable, so you yes. can be using the same machine for like 30, 40, 50 years, instead of like, well, I mean, you try and refurbish an old stand mixer, you know? Right. Yeah, or um, I imagine refurbishing an old stand mixer is a lot easier than a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, a a ask a farmer about John Deere tractors right now. Right to uh, repair. Right to <laughs> repair. Yes. Yeah, go look up that legislation, because that's, I believe, before the House now. I could be wrong, Ooh. but that's something every one of our listeners should give a shit about, is right to repair legislation. Mm -hmm. You should, you have the right, warranty stickers don't mean anything, do whatever you want. Yes. Also, just like, th this is my pettiest beef, it's my pettiest reason to support right for repair, is that like, half of the reason, like, you look at like various geniuses of like the 50s or whatever, people who got Nobel Prizes, the way that they got that way was just, yeah, I used to just pry shit open in the house and like, mm -hmm. fuck around with it until it worked again. That's how I got into computers. Mm-hmm. That's how I got into gender. Pry and open the gender to see if there are more genders in there. <laughs> gender, how does Shaking it work? It. But yeah, no, just for, let's it, talk it, about it, it sounding is, rods it, now. It is, <laughs> it is educational to be able to take shit apart and fix it and repair it. 
on this episode of How It's Made, <laughs> Gender. <laughs> <laughs> you just see all of the genders going past on a conveyor belt. <sighs> yes. <laughs> Uh, gender isn't real, it was a scam used to sell more pink and blue explosives to Americans. Gender was first developed in 1872 by Wilhelm Gender of... <laughs> <laughs> On Turf Island. Yes. Yeah, they tried to militarize gender by shooting gender reveal shells over the trench lines in World mm-hmm. War I. <laughs> yeah, but kind of it makes the phosgene pink. It's originally like a toothpaste additive or something. <laughs> With a good right. toothpaste, you can only get in Canada. The point is, there's there's a difference between it, consumer goods and industrial goods. They're designed for different applications, and and usually your industrial, commercial goods stuff like that. They're they're designed to fail in non catastrophic ways. Um, this is uh, uh, particularly a thing in you know. Vehicles, right? Especially commercial ones. Um, hmm. So, uh, if we go back to funiculars here, there's some some issues with them, um, which make them a little more expensive to run than other stuff. Um, oh! Good Lord. Lord. Jeez, are you pregnant? <laughs> oh! No, he's gone again. He's pregnant. <laughs> no, I, I did two, which means I'm good. If I do a third one, it means I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, you got plague. All right, well, it's yeah, been no, good knowing uh, you, Roz. No, one or three means I'm sick. Two means I'm fine. Uh. <laughs> this is like a warning system <laughs> you've developed. Yes. Yeah, and it works. All right. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna like uh, disrespect your ancient folkways. More than three means it's allergies. Um, mm. So. Most funiculars are sort of one-off designs, right? Um, mm. There's you know, no so she- NIST standard reference funicular. No, nah, there's not a there's not even a standard track gauge. There's not a standard grade. There's not a, there's not anything. They're mostly custom designed for the system they run on, right? And Makes sense. of course, Caprun was no exception. I like you this know, one on the right here, this giant fucking shopping cart. Oh, on the, the, this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think like this is one of the ones where they try and rotate the cabin as the uh Grade changes. Mm. Don't really like that. I don't need yeah. to be spinning around. Well, you're not spinning around. True. No, you're 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 level. You're, you're level. You're like yeah, yeah, stabilized like a tank gun. Oh, that's cool. I want to be stabilized like a tank gun. That's, that's my how fetish. That, that's how the, I can uh, record uh, a podcast at fifty miles an hour. <laughs> I always wanted to record an episode on Amtrak on Amtrak. Yeah, that'd be fun. Mm. Re- record an on the road podcast. We'd Look have to, like, get some sort of, like, fucking Mindhunter opening sequence, like, reel-to-reel recorder to work on, I think. <laughs> Let's go so analog the, uh, with it. The elevators in the gateway arch run on a funicular system where they rotate. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah. I understand. So, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the designers of the Capron funicular cars, uh, designed them sort of based on other funicular cars that they had designed in the past. Uh, namely, they shared a lot of components, was supposed to share a lot of components with the Festungsbahn in Salzburg, right? A uh, fortress oh. train? Yes, okay. it, it, goes up, uh, it goes up the hill to a fortress. Huh. Oh, that's what says on the tin. I think I've taken this one, actually. Um... Hmm. So, now th- th- this one had a heating system in it, right? Um, they used a fan heater, which is just an electric heater with a fan on it, right? From a brand called Domo, right? The car was designed by a firm called um, Swoboda Karasari und Stahlbau Gesundheit. Gesundheit, Ross. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, that's the third one. I'm sick. Um, so they Svob- Svoboda, isn't that like the, the Russian word for freedom? For, oh, okay, fine. It's weird. Mm-hmm. They have a different name now, which is like uh, shorter. Not murderous Co- ink. 
uh, co- coincidentally changed the name shortly after this disaster. Whoopsie um, Daisy LLC. <laughs> yeah, it's like Bodywork and Steel Builders, uh, like LLC. Mm. They had specified, you know, these Domo brand fan heaters for the the Capron uh, funicular, but the purchasing department found these heaters weren't available. Right, these are the commercial rated fan heaters. So instead, they purchased similar uh, fa- uh, fan heaters from a company called Fakir Hobby TLB. I don't oh. like that it has hobby in there. Yeah, yes. that 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 seems this seems like some stuff I get off Alibaba. Mm. And these were these were only certified for domestic use, like they're good for living rooms, right? Whoa. Um, and workers modified them for installation into the funicular cars, nice. right? Uh, and this modification was pretty extensive. Um, it included splitting the units into two parts and bypassing the overheating protection circuit. Hell yeah! Okay. <laughs> now yeah. we're talking. <laughs> they didn't note these uh, modifications on the plan. And of course in not. fact, manuals for the Domo <laughs> space heater were provided to workers assembling the cars. Oh, so just act like it has the one that we yeah. want. So just lock. Yes. That's yeah. okay. Well. I mean, you know, fake it till you make it. I assume that's what that means. Never checked. So, you know, these cars went into service in 1993, um, and they had a perfect safety record for seven years. All right, cool. Great episode, everyone. Uh, Next next one's the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster. (laughs) Listen to Kill James Bond, listen to Trash Future, listen to Lions Led by Donkeys, and we'll see you all next week. Yeah, yeah. bye. Thanks, guys. On the morning of November 11th, oh, no. 2000, no. <laughs> 161 passengers and the conductor boarded the funicular for the ascent to the top of the mountain with the whole bunch of skiing equipment, right? hmm Shortly before they departed, the space heater in the lower um, operator's compartment, because for whatever reason, they decided they needed an operator in the train, despite the fact it was all controlled remotely. It makes um, people feel safer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the space Gotta heater... Buff those fatality numbers. <laughs> space heater... It's, it's, caught, it's Austria. Guys gotta have, like, a, a special uniform, you know? Gotta have, like, a special name tag. Hugo Moss. <laughs> no, I'm thinking more of like an Austro-Hungarian vibe, where like uh, he's, okay. he's like a member of like some ancient brotherhood of funicular car operators, and he's like <laughs> entitled to wear like little gold tassels and shit. So, right before the train departed, the space heater in the lower cabin caught fire. Mm. Um, it's disputed as to exactly what caused this. Whether it was a, 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 a leaky hydraulic line or it was um, some dirt got in there or something, um, the space heater caught fire. No one noticed this for a little bit until the car started moving. Um, no, they really noticed. Now, if you, you had a well designed space heater that was rated for this application, the fire would have been contained to the space heater, it would have been an annoyance for everyone, it would have stopped the train in the tunnel, it would have ruined everyone's day. But it'd be a fire that was easy to contain, right? Hmm. This was not the case. Oh. No, because you didn't get the Domo thing. That you, no, you that bought you it wanted. from Home Depot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You got a yeah, hobby it, heater. Hobby whatever, heater the, yeah. uh, whatever the Austrian Home Depot is. Heim Depot. Uh, Anschluss. Uh, Living <laughs> strong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, hi, hi in, uh, Hein Führer. Hein uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kampf, if you will. Austrians getting mad at us in the comments. That's oh, fine, yes. get mad at us all you want. Yeah. Stop tainting your wine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, our second Austrian disaster. Oh uh, yeah, it really is. Our, our next one will be uh, uh, Austrian leader exports. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, there was a modified consumer space heater in this, and it was, of course, uh, installed next to a hydraulic line, which mm. was made of plastic. Uh oh. Mm. So the fire escape containment in the, um, in the space heater, right? Yeah. It melted the plastic pipe yep. full of flammable hydraulic fluid. Yeah. This does yep. two things. Number one, it makes the fire bigger. 
Yeah. Number two, there's a complete loss of hydraulic pressure. Fail safe. Hooray! Yeah. Hey, we saved everybody. As a result, the train comes to a stop. Yes, a that's safe. what we want. The train right. is stopped. It's not gonna. It's not gonna fall off the the fucking mountain. We mm -hmm. did the thing. Mission accomplished. Job well done, everybody. Go so on. once again, yeah. the next episode is the Roman <laughs> Arrows Bridge disaster. Now, here's the issue. Uh oh. The train stopped oh. in the tunnel. Oh. Oh. That's not where it should be. There's a fire. Oh. Um, which is bad. The fire mm. is now very large because oh. it's fueled by the hydraulic fluid. Mm. Um, and you know, of course, there's uh, it's it's difficult for folks to you know go anywhere because they're in the tunnel. Uh, and of course, it's a really small tunnel we've seen. Yeah, there's no uh, the fire extinguisher was also located in the conductor's compartment that was on which fire. is currently on fire. Sure, yes. well, that's what you want is right by the fire. Convenient. That's sure. That's good. Convenient place. It's good. It's very convenient. Yeah, and the uh, fire extinguisher is, of course, made of metal, which doesn't get really hot. Right. <laughs> All right. So there's there's uh, hundred and how much did I say? Hundred and sixty one passengers on this uh, car, which is now in the tunnel, right on fire. Mm. Um, and it's not an ideal place to have a fire in a tunnel, right? Remembering King's Cross. Remembering King's Cross, yes, yeah. or or uh, Salang, or any other or. Why are we tend to have? Yeah, enclosed space is bad. Enclosed space is bad. You know they enclosed burn very hot. Enclosed space is on an incline, really bad. Yeah. They yeah. burn. They that hot for a long time. But yeah, fire in a sloped tunnel is a catastrophe, right? Because the fire sucks in air from the bottom of the tunnel, and then you know the the smoke comes out the top. Yeah, you're just in a chimney, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a continuous source of oxygen fueling the fire. So once the conductor was alerted to the fire, um, I think shortly before the train stopped, uh, he called the control center at the upper station. He told them, hey, there, there, there's a fire in here. Um, it's not good. Right? And the control center couldn't really do very much. Oh, oh, like, oh that sucks. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, oh I ain't reading all that. Good for you, though. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just do, do, do your best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first thing he tried to do, he tried to open the doors to evacuate the train, right? Uh, uh, the doors didn't open because the hydraulic line was cut and filled with no, fire. Oh, that's, no. That's not so fail safe. So they're just entombed. Yeah. Uh, you never want to be entombed, uh, I find. No, that's not a thing. I, I find the, myself don't desiring. ever put me in a, in a, in a tomb-like situation. Yeah, please I do not bury ideally, me alive. Ideally not. Yeah, I would avoid going into any kind of tomb. Mm. Um, Especially my own, you know? Yeah, exactly. I will say, if you're ever in Boston, you're looking for something to do, the Adams Family Crypt is very interesting. I kind of want to see Grant's tomb. I think that's cool. I've been like, there. That's cool. I wouldn't want to be, like, entombed in Grant's tomb, is the thing. Right. Just you and U.S. Grant hanging out for all eternity. Well, Julia's there, too, so it'd be like a threesome. Oh, what? how erotic. Yeah, that's right. I haven't been to Grant's tomb. I have been to the opposite, which is Lee Chapel. Yeah, um, Sam. We've yeah. all we've all been to General Lee's too. <laughs> Cancel us now, you freaks. Did you, did you know they had to fun fun aside about Lexington, Virginia? Oh, um, well, please. So um the uh Robert E. Lee, I think the fourth, recently died. And they had to, to sneak him into Lee Chapel under cover of darkness. Because they didn't want any protests. <laughs> that's that's the sign of a winning ideology, I find. Yes. <laughs> Reminds me a little bit of the giant, like, um, Francoist, like, uh, hyper-Catholic uh, basilica thing that Franco just had built by, like, Republican prisoners of war in a valley outside of Madrid. And they moved <laughs> Franco's body out oh, of it. Oh, that's right. Uh, and, uh, did they put it back recently? Oh fuck! They might have done, but I I, the thing did. I remember is them moving it, it, them moving it out like very surreptitiously. 
They're mo- moving it out slowly, piece by piece. Yeah. <laughs> Took one, one piece, piece, piece at, at a time. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't cost me a dime as you're like hopping along with a hacksaw. <laughs> I think somebody tried to do this with one Perone because they broke into his tomb and they took his hands. So oh, okay. It's just, Very uh, it's just a series. It's just a uh, one one dictator corpse. Um, created out of several years of dictators. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Franken like dictator. Yeah. It's 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, Franco. <laughs> and we've gotten copyright struck. Uh huh. Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, so uh, a few passengers at the bottom of this funicular. I don't even know how we got on this subject. Um, <laughs> Managed to uh, break a window. Uh, one of the people down at the back of the train was a volunteer firefighter, right? Nice. And um, he was like, we have to go down. So they went down the tunnel. The tunnel has like a walkway on the side with some steps. So yeah, we saw in the first slide, it looked treacherous as shit. Yeah. It was made of wood or something. Luigi so I, was there. Yeah. I, think 12 people, I think 12 people got out that way. Uh, those were the lucky ones. Yeah. I'm impressed they were able to break the window. Yeah. I, they, I used a ski pole because it was uh, these smart. Are a, acrylic mm-hmm. shatter resistant windows. Ah, oh, that's smart. Yeah. So, the. Um, you got to carry one of those little like keychain, like glass breakers on you at all times. The conductor managed to manually open the side doors, right? Mm hmm. And and these are the um, ones that had failed due to the hydraulic lines being yes. currently on fire. Yeah. Okay. And the people who hadn't been overcome by smoke evacuated the train. But by this point, the fire was below them. Oh, they had no. only one place to go, which was up. Nope. Up yeah. a distance of like two and a bit kilometers, right? Yes. You're not going to make that, guys. Yeah, that's, it's not, not ideal. In the meantime, there was another train up the tunnel, right? Oh, boy. And the smoke was now billowing up the toll tunnel into the upper station. Um, so workers and passengers evacuated the upper station, and in the process, they left all the emergency exits open. So now the chimney effect was much stronger because there was a clear path for all the smoke to go, right? Oh, oh dear. I feel really bad about that one because it's like, what are you gonna do? Like, close the emergency right. exit behind you? Right. You just sort of yeah. You're just fucked essentially. Mm. So below, the conductor led the passengers up the tunnel, and as did the conductor on the descending train, which I think had three people on it, right? Mm. Um, and uh, well, they all mm. died. Yeah. 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 All, all of them were reason. asphyxiated. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I think maybe what you want to do is not be in the a, a extremely chimney, chimney yeah. fire yeah. if you can help it. Yeah, I think that that's something to avoid. Um, Good advice, so, guys. <laughs> yes. So if, you, if you're on a funicular and you see a fire break out, jump out the back. Mm-hmm. Yes. Slide down. Um, go go down. Go down the hill, not up. Just get, getting getting as close to the floor as possible, always good advice for fire, right? Yes. So, in total, 155 people were killed. Jesus. Um, me, no thank you. 150 of them on the ascending train, two people on the descending train, and three people in the upper station. Um, firefighters managed to get into the upper station and rescue one person who didn't initially escape. So I, how bad the smoke is that it's like even with the emergency doors open and stuff, it still, still kills people in right, the station above. Right, that's nuts. I'm sort of just looking at this train and I'm like, this seems this thing looks like it's entirely made of plastic. Mm, um, right. So I imagine you know you have like a high heat fire. Um, that's just fuel, right there. Good point. Mm. So that that's what that train looked like after it burned for several hours. There's not a lot of it left. Not a lot left, yeah. Well, I was concerned about weight savings earlier. Um, <laughs> Stick a little GTI stamp on the back of it. <laughs> yeah. Nah, man, this is a, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, it's a weight reduction kit. R. <laughs> yeah. Particular mm-hmm. ST. So, 
after this uh after this event occurred there was of course a whole bunch of litigation right yeah as i was uh, 16 time. 16 people involved with the design and manufacture of the funicular were charged uh criminally charged mm-hmm. and they were all acquitted yep yeah mm-hmm. yep mm-hmm. all of them what about there the was... people who installed the fan they shouldn't have installed no so, uh, Everyone Dude, was. We can, we can barely like convict people of crimes that they've like done, confessed to, like <laughs> maliciously, let alone accidentally or negligently. Yeah, I, there's just insufficient evidence to blame any one single person. Okay. Um, you know, it's always uh, there's always like um, you know, it's always a problem when you have one of these big systemic issues. Um, you know, it's not like you can charge a corporation either. Like, what are you gonna do? Uh, well, you can. You could find them, but I don't think they really did that. That's the cost of business, you could, yeah. You, you could do, like, Maoist-style mass executions, I suppose. This is true, yeah. Just an idea. Just a thought. Not ha- doesn't have any other, like, um, Implications, to, ramifications. No, no, none of that, no. I not talk about not corporate, just corporate, idea. corporate, corporate just responsibility idea. or, like, corporate personhood that we can talk about. And Yeah, no, anyway. I did not check how much uh, compensation the family's got. Um, not sure. Probably should have done that. <sighs> some oh, amount of Xboxing. Yeah, Xboxing. some amount of Xboxing. Um, there was a lot of complex litigation around really technical stuff, like what the definition of a vehicle was under Austrian Ugh. law. Oh, God. Which, which, the least helpful jurisprudence can ever be yeah. is when it's really going to decide... Because, like... Okay, fine. I accept that, like in uh, particularly in a common law system, but also to some extent in a in a like a civil uh, in a civil law system, you can only set precedent. You can only set stare decisis on terrible things that have happened. You can't be hypothetical about this and say, "Well, if this were to happen." But still, it's particularly galling when there's like actual people who have been uh, melted, and you are just being like. Yeah, no, but actually, I need to like jack myself off in my study with my law books for a couple of uh, a couple of years about well, if you this. Insist. Yeah, um, but I think the the moral of the story here is um, twenty one point five million in compensation. So twenty one point five million divided by one hundred and fifty five. Hmm. Divided by one hundred fifty five. Uh. Hundred and thirty-eight thousand seven hundred and nine euros. Uh, hmm. Xbox cost in euros. <laughs> hey, don't forget inflation. We don't need to do inflation. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so an Xbox costs two hundred and ninety-nine euros. Uh, so I'm just gonna put that in the calculator here. We need just like an app to simplify this. Yeah. Um, okay, so one hundred thirty-eight seven oh nine. Divided by two hundred and ninety-nine, six hundred Xbox. You got f- right. you got four hundred and sixty-three Xboxes out of this. Uh, I was close. That's not bad. You play with yeah. all your friends P- uh, per dead person. Four hundred and sixty-three point nine Xbox. All right. Well, I mean that's 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 probably, a Bitcoin farm. That's, that's like probably more more Xbox than I think uh, most of the disasters we cover. That's true. Yeah, it's above average. That's for sure. Yes. So, uh, uh, I guess the moral of the story: walk use, up or down. Use mm. walk down. Devices, except you have to walk up. <laughs> use devices rated for the application that you're using them for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good advice. Don't, don't don't try and like kit bash together like consumer goods into an industrial application. Use an industrial piece of technology for an industrial application. Kit bashing, fine on model trains, not fine <laughs> on real trains. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Great. Well, yep. I'm bummed out. Yeah, now I'm depressed. Great. Thanks, Ross. Well, it's okay. Because you know, I think this one was Alice's idea. It was. This yeah. is true, yes. I thought I thought we hadn't done a depressing enough one for a while. Thank you. And I thought we, never, we needed to all traumatize ourselves again. We haven't done a funicular one ever, so. Yeah, first funicular one, second Austrian one, second chimney effect fire one. Yes. Speaking of chimney effect. Oh no. We have a, we have a segment on this podcast called 
safety third. Which which button did I? No, no that's not no, it. No. It, was, it wasn't I that one. Don't know what that was. Oh, it was a guy saying, hasn't got that sloppy wet. Listen. Hasn't got that sloppy wet. But like, every time I press it, it gets slightly worse in quality, so... Thank you. Hasn't got that sloppy wet. I see. Great. That really wow. showed respect for the dead here. Shake hands with danger. All right. There we so go. So we're, we're picking up from where we left off the last safety third. Yeah, part right. two. Part two. Because we ended on a cliffhanger. The man is... Just almost got hit by uh, an Amtrak train. Um, right. So, also, there was the time I had to go validate some signals going into the Cascade Mountain Tunnel, see figure four. That's uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. The Cascade Mountain Tunnel is badass. It's about eight miles long and goes through some of the most beautiful parts of the country and is ideally located as far away from Iowa uh, as you <laughs> can physically be in America, right? <laughs> as far away from Iowa. I thought it as far away from anything. I, I is it? No, I'm confused. It's definitely not as it's far. Like, away it's like from a traveling Iowa salesman yeah. problem between you have to get both <laughs> as far away from Iowa and as far away from anything else as mm -hmm. you can be. And what's the antipode of Iowa in America? You know, like you got to yeah. answer me that. Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, mm. American Samoa. <laughs> Furthest point. I'm gonna look. Furthest point in the U.S. from Iowa. This is the podcast where I Google things, and it's it's, it's well, uh, furthest city and country from Des Moines, Iowa, is Perth, Australia. That's not really <laughs> helpful unless the U.S. annexes Perth, Australia. It's coming. Yeah. So. The train crews use scuba equipment while in the tunnel. What? And getting to watch a train come through while the fans were blowing out the exhaust is one of the top five things I've ever seen in my life. Nice. While, it, while it's cool to look at, much like Nietzsche's Abyss, it also looks back at you. Hmm. There's two sets of CCTV cameras watching out for Osama bin Laden to do a terrorism. One goes back to my company's headquarters in an undisclosed location, and the other goes to Department of Homeland Security in D.C. I had to go all the way up to the door in full view and unannounced to the cameras to go measure a signal. I only did this after getting promises from my coworker I could live on his couch if I got fired, and then he'd put money in my commissary account if I got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good buddy. You, yeah. you like step out in front of the cameras and like you hear a black hawk like touching down behind you. You're just like, uh... <laughs> you promised. <laughs> it's no, incredible. He'll put, he'll put it money in the commissary when you're in, in federal prison. There's incredible lengths they went to to de-electrify this tunnel because um, it used to have electric trains running through it. Um, and then eventually they've decided, well, we could probably try and run diesel trains through it, which, you know, again, the right aforementioned there. scuba equipment, also huge fans at one side that change the air in the tunnel right after a train goes through. Um, <laughs> nah, fuck it. Just give the drivers scuba equipment, too. We're not using electricity. This is mm -hmm. America. <laughs> <laughs> so, now... On to the real scary stuff. Oh boy. Oh good. On this audit, I was checking up on the work of the resident office morons we'll call Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Get their asses. I had gotten to a control point during my previously mentioned audit, C figure five. Let's call it CP There's Your Problem, or <laughs> CP69420 if you're the new school. Nice. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, CP There's Your Problem. I guess that's here. Okay. Um, basically, the easiest CP is what's pictured. You have three absolute signals, each controlling one approach to the switch, a power dual switch, and all the associated metadata to make PTC work. Um, all right, so it, it's easy. The, the track just splits and there's three signals. Okay. Um, so... The train needs to know exactly where each signal is because they govern your authority to move as a train in centralized traffic and co controlled territory, right? If you map these incorrectly, the positive train control will not stop the train in the right place in case of emergency. 
Hmm. During my audit, I found every single signal was in the D- GPS database over 20 feet away from the signal. See Red Cross for not the scale example. That's okay, probably so fine. Uh, track, one, track one westbound is here, according to P- also, uh, GPS. I've just learned an intriguing way in which the Kessler syndrome can fuck up a railroad. <laughs> yes. Useful to know. Well, I, the way the railroads are implementing PTC um, based on GPS, I think is, um, you know, they're, they're trying to really cheap out. In Europe, there's been, this technology has been implemented since like the 70s, and it's all line side equipment as mm. opposed to relying on GPS, and it works a lot better. Um, <laughs> so, you know, GPS is already a fickle bitch, right? Our units were <laughs> submeter accurate. And we had to pay extra for that, so it would routinely give us an accurate reading for plus minus 18 inches. So we like to pass assets at no more than 5 feet, so if the GPS was feeling like adding 18 inches, we'd still be in FRA specs. Um, Train GPSs aren't that accurate. They're more accurate than your phone, which roughly knows what zip code you're in, but they're still not very good. Wait a second, but I thought the NSA was tracking my location all the time through my phone, and they were able to like zoom in on a big like uh, a big wall map of monitors and like read shit over my shoulder. Oh yeah, they have like um, there, there's there's one there's a specific set of satellites which are you know all monitoring Alice Caldwell Kelly. <laughs> um, yeah, after that <laughs> ISS tweet. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You saw you did it to yourself. <laughs> They're installing shielding on the ISS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a little engine just to give it like an orbital boost anytime. <laughs> I don't know that that would... You'd have to anticipate the nut. Mm. <laughs> In order oh, that's for why that you need the surveillance, w- yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what the surveillance is for. I guess, yeah, I guess and then you would be like, okay, we're, you know, we gotta... We gotta... <laughs> I don't even... <laughs> I'm, I'm, the orbital mechanics of this, I think, are um, mm-hmm. more complex than we can go into right that's now. That's true. That's true. <laughs> like yeah. you, you have to like really get into like orbital rendezvous calculations in order to make this work. So someone's going to have to simulate this in Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your service in advance, folks. Yes. So anyway, it's important to have precise data so the train has less room to mess up. I had found this issue on every single control point for about 50 miles, and that's when I realized Tweedledee and Tweedledum had passed these signals. By a a pass, I mean, um, uh, uh, had approved approved from a moving high rail truck. (laughs) So you don't even have to stop and get out? Fuck yes. That's, 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 that's terrific. I started taking pictures of how far off these dumb fucks were and sent the email <laughs> to my boss to send to our director. This was not the first time they had screwed, screwed the pooch, and here they are, willfully signing off on FRA audited safety documents that they had verified these signals were accurate when they were definitely not. Well, the director got my well-researched email and promptly de- deleted it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hopefully this got quietly fixed, but those two morons got to keep their jobs and avoided non-elective new asshole surgery. Um, (laughs) Meanwhile, in the lab, Tweedledee and Tweedledum were up to new shenanigans. For, uh, For PTC to work, not only do the locations have to be mapped, but so does signal aspects and signal information. Uh, that's, you know, that's what's the, uh, the signal aspect is whether it's, uh, you know, green, yellow, red, other fun stuff, which is weird. Um, weird fucking purple light, you know. Or flashing yellow, or, or like mm. a yellow, and a, or like, a, there's like two signal heads, and like the top one's red, and the other one's yellow. There, there's all kinds of weird stuff with signals. Um, so, you can get really into this stuff. Oh yeah. Train, tra- like, train signal guys are the train guys of train guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a bunch of freaks. <laughs> yeah, go home, farmers. Yeah, you get a you get a you get a um uh, a, a a signal with three signal heads and like 
uh, the top Stop one's it. red, but the middle one's <laughs> yellow, it. and then the, the middle. Yeah. So you get a position light signals. You get all kinds of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so since most of our rail is uh, centralized traffic control (CTC). This just involves plugging in a radio into the signal, uh, the signal bungalow, you know, the little shed next to the single signal, uh, and to the CTC computer, and then figuring out what code means what. I could get really into this topic because trains are my kink, but I'll spare so you all si- the signal guys, single signal guys, all the all the all the signal ladies, yes, <laughs> all the signal ladies, <laughs> wearing like a high vis leotard. <laughs> Never know you're going to need it. Safety first. That's right. Basically, we have to make a translation document so when bit offset 2 gives code 1, we know that really means switch 1 is reversed. So you have to correctly identify each switch and signal, uh, determine the appropriate direction and orientation, and simulate a code change to make sure it works with our hardware. This guy's so into this. If you don't do this right, you will cause PTC to think the signal is doing one thing, for example, giving a clear aspect, while the real signal is giving a big red aspect, thus negating the usefulness of PTC. Yeah, positive train controllant. Yes, uh, negative train control. Mm. Inverse yeah. train control. Yes. Uh, proceed on a red uh, <laughs> stop. It's on, opposite day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It'd be like that one day when Sweden changed which side of the road they drove on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> These dumb fucks on multiple occasions would publish the trains to in, uh, publish the trains incorrect aspects like mapping, uh, mapping the one westbound signal to the two westbound signal or that the eastbound signal was increasing versus decreasing. Every single time we would hope so, every single time we hoped someone would pull them aside and give them the ass chewing of a lifetime, but alas, they were allowed to continue putting good union employees lives in danger. Oh, good. For my final story, you need to know a bit about timetables and speed restrictions. It gets worse? Yeah. <laughs> speed restrictions are layered, going from fastest to slowest. 1A is the fastest possible speed on a subdivision, called track speed. You can generally only do this on the main line. There's a 1B that protects shitty track that we've decided to never fix, or <coughs> curves and grades. <laughs> So, you know, don't go 10, 70 miles an hour down a 10% grade because you'll probably have a boo-boo. That's not been my experience in train simulator. You got to uh, get those timetables. I don't know why Burlington Northern mm-hmm. Santa Fe just doesn't, you know, turn derailments off in the simulator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you got to turn those off. You got to turn time penalties off and you, you have a nice time. Yeah, you'll, you'll run the trains much more efficiently that way. Um, put put me in charge of uh, precision <laughs> Buffett, uh, scheduled railroading. <laughs> then there are one C or turnout speeds, which controls are uh, are in our previous example the track between the switch and the two westbound signal. Right, so like here, mm. um, basically you have to slow the fuck down going through a, a tight turn. Then finally, there's the one D speed. Uh, these are for entering main track or EMT, right? So like a uh, an industrial siding, right? Usually EMT tracks are really shitty. Um, they're for industries with rail service, and no one ever maintains them. They're usually five miles an hour, although sometimes you'll find a spicy ten mile an hour one. <laughs> Another part of my job was to go through the timetable and determine where all these speed restrictions were load up our lab simulator and basically play Atari 2600 train simulator to make yes. sure all the speeds were correct. Yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> Since I was a dumb kid and still thought meritocracy was a thing, I would do <laughs> extracurricular audits when I wasn't busy in the audience, uh, in the office, and just recheck the speeds on active subdivisions and submit the defects to be fixed in the next version of the database. This was fine until I was running through one of the subdivisions that Tweedledum and Tweedled D had done, and I found there wasn't a single 1D speed in the entire subdivision. Every single EMT was coded for a track switch, meaning you could flip a hand-throw switch 
and sent a fully loaded coal train into an industry track at 70 miles an hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's your coal. <laughs> you want an expedited delivery, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly arriving in dust form, but it is it is there. I think there was uh I, I could have sworn there was some incident a while back of um some kids throwing a switch somewhere on a northeast corridor and like a, a New Haven uh train just slammed into the side of a building. Yeah. Um Yeah, you've told us about that before. I don't remember what it was. But I but don't yeah, remember yeah, yeah. what it was, yeah. Um so you know, I submitted this defect and got pulled aside by one of the managers who told me I need to stop doing all my auditing. This is when I realized the communists were right, and I became a Satanist. See <laughs> figure six. <laughs> You're here in milepost 666. Nice. What, yeah. what, what, did these, what did these guys have that they kept fucking, like... Is this like a jobs program, or like... Ha, uh, well, PTC was mandated by Congress after a derailment in Los Angeles, and the mm-hmm. railroads are very Frankfurt. mad at having to implement it. Uh, just these these two guys, like you yeah. don't you don't want to fire those guys, yeah, ever at all. Okay, uh, yeah, they just don't want to fire them. The railroads aren't very enthusiastic about implementing PTC. Uh, they just run the whole railroad off a of train order as well, like keeping the system up to like the barely maintained standards, you know, just so that they can say they have it. Um, <laughs> or in Jersey's case, borrowing from SEPTA and then just oh, parking a, them. That was a funny. Okay. So that, that's a funny story about um, New Jersey transit tried to make the uh, PTC deadline um, and, and they needed to m- meet a milestone where X amount of their equipment, like a percentage had to have PTC installed. So what they did was SEPTA was retiring a bunch of uh, electric locomotives at the time. So New Jersey Transit leased those locomotives, hauled them onto the property, and then said, look, the percentage of our fleet that has PTC is now above the threshold and never used those locomotives. Incredible. Yes. Um, it's, in, it, it's amazing what you can do when there's just Rather than having one big railroad, there's a whole bunch of different railroads with fiefdoms. Um, <laughs> well, what have we learned? Um, railroading, it's stupid and dangerous. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Tra- train good, railroads... Railroad mm. bad. <laughs> That's that data signals guy. He will give you that good loving. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, our next episode is... Oh wait, that was safety third. That was safety third. Our our next episode is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster. Anyone got commercials before we go? What's the kill James James Bond? Bond. Kill James Bond. Listen to that. Listen to Lions Led by Donkeys. Uh, Watch uh, Do Not Eat One on YouTube. When is Franklin coming out? When is international shipping on show? I have an update. Yes. Uh, Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about after we're done recording. All right, sweet. Yes. It may be coming soon, folks. Watch this face. Yes. Um, yeah, so that was, that was, that was a podcast. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.